Yeah. So next up is Enrico, who will talk about scientific computing workflow. Hello. Hello, hello. Yeah, I'll join join Enrico in commenting on the on the talk as well. Like so we get some rapport, multiple views, multiple eyes on the same issue. Yeah. So Enrico's screen is shared, so there you go. Yeah, so next up is Enrico and Simo. And they're talking sort of the different tools and strategies for doing things, like basically from your laptop to the largest clusters to sort of frame this in the, um, in the big picture. OK. Yeah, so and as just briefly, as a reminder, for those who register in the email, you also have the schedule. And there you find, for example, the clickable links of the slides. It's not really slides, it's like a web page where we collected some useful info as well as the hack and D link and uh, whatever is useful. And we will have a break at 12.50. So that's enough. You have 10 minutes for stretching your legs. Today, maybe it's a bit, uh, you know, on one hand, it might feel a bit boring because there's not much coding today or running scripts on a cluster. But we noticed from previous year that this kind of introduction, setting the context for some people, especially they're, they're really they're really important because they just never had this basic basic training on, on these topics. So these slides that you find in the page that I was just showing, you know, it's it's the minimum that one should know about scientific computing or even about just computing. There is this funny XKCD comic. So this is, I mean, this, this is about machine learning. The, the guy saying, this is your machine learning system. Yeah, you put the data here, there's some formulas and then some, some output comes out. And what if the answers are wrong, you just steer it. I mean, you can replace machine learning with any method used in any scientific field and, 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 and basically that's it. Or at least that's, that's the first approach. I, at least I had the first approach that it's like I have a black box. I put some numbers inside, I get something. I hope that you know they, they are fine and I can get them published. So this type of workflow is you know, in, in, in any scientific, at, at least in any quantitative scientific, um, scientific field, we, have, we run some experiment or we make some simulations so that we produce some numbers, the raw data. And then we might have some models because we invent models, data-driven models, or maybe we have models from the literature, hypothesis from the literature. We crunch the numbers here and we get, you know, some tables, p-value, t-values, maps, whatever is significant in your field. And then we, you know, put them in figures, into posters, into papers, we publish, we repeat, and then we, that's it. <laughs> that's, um, Enrico, <laughs> quick, quick question. So uh, often I, I get a feeling when uh, when looking at, uh, well, uh, talk when the people are talking about scientific computing, that people are only referring to these like models and only prefer uh, talking about these, like how do you like, let's say calculate some matrix inverse or something like that. You, you It's only about that, but isn't this like everything here related to scientific computing, like all parts of this flowchart. Yeah, How maybe. You... I mean, we were discussing this earlier. I think um, I found one one definition on the scientific computing is the collection of tools, techniques, and theories to solve a compute to solve on a computer mathematical models or problems. But I think that this day, maybe you know, in recent years, people talk about data science. So at least with the tools we use and with how people use the tools, it doesn't, you know, it's not just about inverting matrices or optimizing some existing algorithm to make it faster. It, it really is, you know, in, I would dare say that even people, you know, using Excel to compute whatever the a t test on a table it's uh, it's scientific computing because yes, that's, so it's, you know. <laughs> it's more about the, like, uh, the process than uh, necessarily the the tools used to do the process. Yeah, the process that allows you to basically process process some data that is in in this case used in a scientific context. Hmm. So this simple schematic here kind of tries to answer the question: How does computing happen? I'm sure most of you 
have come across something like this, that, you know, they have the box, the piece of hardware that has the CPU and the RAM and disks and other things. So this can be your laptop or your workstation. And then on top of it, you have the operating system and you interact with the operating system, let's say with MATLAB, with R, etc. So often, I, how can I say, when we try to help people, it's it, it we shouldn't give 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 for granted that everyone knows what's a cpu what's a gpu what's a ram so here i collected some uh, glossary from the amazing wikipedia which is the source of knowledge for all the students and scientists in the planet but um but already like if you can think the cpu as like the where the computing happens where the operations the sums and whatever happens and the ram is this memory so where you can keep in a in a in a in a physical space store you know the numbers that you're working with so cpu and ram they're often talking together and then i'm sure some some of you are already using gpu and some of you would like to start learning gpu basically the idea is that the architecture the hardware ar architecture is more parallel so the g stands for graphical processing unit because they kind of were started coming out for 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 processing the graphics for for fast graphics but now they, they use a lot also for computing and then what you have on top of the hardware is um, it's basically what you are what you are uh, already familiar with because most likely you're using a laptop or a, or a desktop to do some uh, some computing some data science um there's also like the question of the ssd like over there like What's the difference between, like, in Finnish, at least, people, especially from the olden days, like in the 80s, people were talking about, uh, like, muisti, like, they were talking about memory, and and there's a difference between, like, this RAM memory and this uh, hard drive space, like, well, hard drives are going away sometimes on laptops, and, but what what is the difference? How would you formulate it? Yeah, that maybe if you think of this RAM, it, it's literally the numbers that you really need to access them fast because they need to be computed by the CPU because they need to visualize them in a, in a, in a plot. The SSD is where you store the files. I understand that even now with the, with the newer generation, the concept of file and file system starts to be difficult because if all you, all you grew up with is just iPads and, and things like that, you, you, you don't see the files anymore. You don't see the file system, but this is a more like a, a persistent storage that is still within the same hardware and here actually i didn't mention the cloud storage because yes this can be in a box that you physically can touch but you might have data that is stored somewhere else in your university on google drive or mm. so that you know you can plug external data and run it on your physical box but then as i will show you later sometimes the physical box is limiting and then we we and this is why we're here basically yeah i would also like to, one analogy i would probably give them is that the ssd is the like if you have a phone uh if you have a phone and then you have cpu that executes let's say you run a firefox and facebook and i don't know messenger whatsapp you have run different applications on your phone and then you have they run on the cpus and the ram is that like when when your phone starts to get slow and you then you need to maybe reboot it or you need to close some applications that means that ram is usually running out because you're running too many stuff too much stuff at the same time and the ssd is the one that runs out when you get another operating system update or you get too much photos on your phone or whatever and then you need to sync them to cloud or whatever like that is the storage for the applications like when you need to install a new application and then it says that you don't have any enough space then uh, the ssd is that space that is like this kind of a storage space whereas the other space is the ram is uh, when the application is actually running and it needs to store the uh, the variables of the application so what do i need to make computing happen most likely you are already touching right now a box whether it's a laptop or a workstation where you could already get something done you are able to run python or matlab or whatever but sometimes you need the you need the feeling that you need to scale up to a bigger system so often the perception that people have is that okay now i get access to an hpc cluster suddenly i'm not limited by my 
laptop that only has two CPUs and whatever amount of RAM, because now I can run my code on N CPUs, maybe 100 CPUs. The issue, of course, that people don't realize is that, um, you know, I give you the example of pasta, not, not, not just because I'm Italian, but uh, if, if it takes 10 minutes to cook a pasta, if I have 10 pots, it's not going to take me one minute to make the same pasta, you know, so some things will always take 10 minutes, even if, even though I have 10 pots, you know, so in practice, some tasks are not ready to be parallelized as they are. Simo will actually cover this more deeply and with practical examples on uh, Friday on the parallelization. But this is exactly when you, you know, basically the most difficult question is understanding your computational needs. Do you really need more CPUs? Do you really more need more RAM? So in this part of the, of this course is basically knowing already that maybe what you need to do doesn't require parallelization. It just requires long time because it cannot be parallelized and still HPC can be helpful because then it means that you can leave something running for five days on a remote system and you don't need to leave your laptop open for five days and night hoping that you know that it doesn't melt in the in the meantime. Yeah, I, I'd also add to this that like often, like especially if you have recently, let's say bought a laptop or something like that, you see like this all of or, or phone or whatever, you see they're advertised based on like, like this has 2.8 gigahertz processor and this has that and that amount of RAM and memory and, and something like that. Uh, you see these numbers that are like higher and you think that the higher numbers mean that everything is better, but that's not what HPC is about uh, really. Uh, of course, the numbers might be higher, but usually it's more about like, how do we make a lot of them, a lot of these things discuss with each other more so how, how do we get more CPUs discussing with each other so that they can collaborate and do something together? And how do you like um, uh, do this? Of course, sometimes you just want bigger numbers, but in many cases, if you actually need, if you want speed, you want to, uh, or like more, you want to, let's say, uh, run your, your own model uh, like hundred times, you, you can, you can use 100 pots to, if you need to cook for the whole family, you can use like 10 pots to cook for the whole family and you get the stuff done faster. So, so there's various different ways of, of like uh, working with a lot more resources, but it's not only about like you get like a faster machine. It's more about this communication. And, and this brings this problem that usually the, yeah, the user themselves needs to know how the program behaves. Like, can the program communicate? Can the program understand that, okay, I need to do this part and the other, other part of the program needs to do the other part. And uh, this is like, uh, it's, there's no one way of solving this. Uh, usually it's trial and error or reading a lot of documentation, but, uh, but usually it's, uh, the, this is the, the kind of way that HPC works. Yeah. So basically you are here most likely because you reach this stage that your computer is not enough for your computing needs and you need to scale. And so where can you go for doing that? I skip the text, but let's just focus on the picture. This is kind of the graphical picture to, that you can save in your head to understand where the computing happens with HPC or with whatever remote computing. You are basically here somewhere on the internet with your home connection, laptop or desktop machine, whatever you're doing there. But sometimes it's not enough because you don't have enough resources because you don't want to leave your, your laptop on for seven days running MATLAB or Python hoping that it doesn't crashes. So then some people, you know, maybe you are you belong to some department where you might have your office um, workstation and some departments, some universities, they allow you to that you can basically connect from remote to the workstation and then maybe you have more power there you can run things things better there are other tools that basically even to a web browser you can connect to again some some other box that often are called nodes so some some physical machines and sometimes also virtual machines that will basically allow you to run your your code a very famous one is this mybunder.org there's a there's a collection of links here in, in the bottle where you know you can try Jupyter, you can try Binder, 
Kaggle has these kernels. So, you know, there's, there's, there's many ways of running computing without using your laptop anymore so that the computing can happen, can happen remotely. But then also these services, you know, they might have limitations. At Alto and at Isaac University, we have a service called VDI, which is like virtual desktop interface. I can give a demo if there's some time in the end. It's basically that from the browser, you can see a workstation in your university, like at Alto or at Isaac University. And you can do the same thing that you would do in your remote workstation. But also there, there are, there are limitations. They're not too powerful and they usually basically log you out after 24 hours. So then comes the HPC cluster where usually there's an entry point, the login node where you basically connect to this entry point. And this is what we will test today at 3 p.m. that you are able to actually enter this login node. But the login node is just an entry point for the actual cluster because then there are many, 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 many other machines, other pieces of hardware. And then you basically need to say, okay, you know what? I need a, a computer with 16 CPUs and I don't know, 20 gig of RAM for uh, five days. You ask this from the login node and the login node sends you to some of these nodes here. And now for five days, you have this machine just for you where you can run your computing. So in practice, this is, you know, for, for day two, for, for, for tomorrow and Friday, we will cover exactly this. How do you access the login node? How you can you start accessing the individual node and all these differences of uh, storage systems? Yeah, I, I'd give this kind of a analogy for this is that basically like, let's say you, you want to create, you want to buy like a custom made table or something. You can either like order it from, from the nearby like, like a carpenter who's like, let's say, like in this analogy, that would be your uh, workstation in in like your office in Alto. You you go there and then you you work with you work there. Basically, you work in the uh, in the with the carpenter and you make the table. Or if you want to make like thousand tables, you suddenly are like, okay, I cannot make it anymore in my local like computer. I cannot make it in the local uh, local carpenter. You put an order to China to make like some company in China to make you a thousand tables. And, and for that, you need to give them specifications. You need to tell them what they need to do, like the instructions, what you want them to do, and they will do what, what you have instructed them to do, but they, they will, uh, if, if you give them bad instructions, they will give you a table with five legs or something. And, and you need to, you need to specify what, what you want to order basically. And this is the similar kind of way that the login node or some other system is, is this kind of like a, like a ordering system, basically where you go there and you specify that, okay, I want this amount of resources. I want this computer and run these things for me and it will run it there. And, uh, you will get your, hopefully your table, uh, finished. Uh, but basically it's this kind of like you move the the process of actually doing the stuff like what is the actual doing of stuff uh it's well of course the main doing of stuff is that you write the instructions that is what you are actually doing but what is actually like somebody's to have to do the calculations and actually do the stuff and that is like computing and running some code and that can be like moved somewhere else and and in this kind of a situation you want to move it inside this kind of a big big warehouse of computers where where the computers can just like do whatever you have instructed them to do and then uh, give you the answers back yeah this is a very good point another thing that i forgot to mention is that sometimes it's also an issue with the data maybe because the data is too big and there's no way that you can store it locally or maybe because also the data might be sensitive that your university or whoever gave you the data they don't allow you to take the data out of this you know, private network, which are basically these uh, these uh, black or white circles that you see here. But in general, I mean, understanding where the computing happens and what makes it happen happening, it, it can give you a better idea of say, you know, yeah, actually, you know what, I really need 10 CPUs, or maybe actually, no, you need only one CPU, but doing the same thing over the multiple workshop that, that Simo was saying over, over multiple nodes. So as a, we have a, a long collection of public resources here. 
that people can uh, immediately get their computing done you know not 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 just limited by your by your local machine but of course each service especially the free ones they might have other limitations luckily most of you here are part of some organization in finland and also abroad because we also have people from outside finland here and so you can always apply for access to this um, computing cluster in your organization or in the HCSC, for example. So we still have a um, couple of minutes. I was briefly checking the HackMD, and I'm glad that people like the pasta analogy. But it's really, you know, even like it, it takes some time to understand parallelization and um, and I, I, I think I've seen many people disappointed when they move their code from the laptop to one of these HPC systems. They actually felt that their code was slower in the HPC system. And suddenly they're like, so what is the point? I went through all this effort. But then you need to understand why is the code slower? Because maybe you know, you're not requesting for enough, for enough resources or maybe the, the tools that you're using in a laptop, they're not exactly the same version. and. Um, implementations that you might have in this HPC system. So, Simo, do you want to add something else on to close this? Yeah, I would, I would probably close it that the, like the, the main things that uh, I will hope you have gathered from this is that like basically uh, scientific computing is multitude of things. It's par partially like things that like organizing stuff and doing stuff like that, that you need to like handle yourself like in a sense that you need to keep track of how like you need to choose how how you want to organize your stuff and how to get stuff done like where do you basically put your uh, tools when you're when you're doing your um, uh, computing but it's also this kind of like what kind of resources you have what kind of uh, like especially when you turn it into remote usage like for HPC uh, it's also this kind of like, how do you, uh, w what does the code actually use? Like what kind of tools it actually uses? So basically like if you have a recipe uh, for cooking and you need to cook, like let's say the pasta for for whole whole Italian wedding, you need to cook pasta for the whole wedding. You need to use the tools available in the kitchen where you're going to. And, and you need to choose the correct kitchen and correct utensils and stuff like that. So, so basically, if you if you book a kitchen, you better be certain that there's enough pots for, uh, for the for the whole uh, cooking process. So basically, you need like it's 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 very there's lots of things that are going to come during the course as well about specifics. How do you ask for different resources and stuff like that? But the main thing uh, you hopefully gather is that like there is this kind of like um, distinction between like all kinds of like, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of like coding stuff. And then there's what's actually being done with some tools, like some resource, some actual machine somewhere is calculating it. And this, once you get this, uh, like this kind of distinction that, okay, I want to cook pasta. I can choose between different kinds of kitchens. I can choose between different kinds of utensils to, to do the cooking then it's easier to choose okay i like this needs this kind of a big pot i will use this one so so but this kind of like separating this layer of layer uh in your mind it helps you a lot in the in the long run because that's how we usually perceive the thing that like we try to separate okay what's what's happening and where is it happening and where can be quite nebulous when you're working across internet but but there's actually somewhere like cloud isn't in a cloud. It's actually some machine room in Hamina or somewhere like for Google. Uh, like there's no actual cloud where the data gets uploaded. There's actual like somewhere somebody has to actually store the data or calculate something. And uh, once you get this kind of a distinction, uh, it helps you a lot uh, along the way. Excellent. I think we could have a break now. I don't know if it's 1 p.m., but I, I see the people on HackMD, they got really inspired by this cooking metaphor. Somebody's writing that you prepare one sauce, but then you can cook many different pasta yeah. types. Hopefully you, know. you had lunch before, <laughs> the, before the talk. Like.
But this is exactly the you know that the, the you realize that a part of the process you just need one CPU because you 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 can't really parallelize it just one source. But then maybe you need you have three types of pasta that you mm, run in yeah. three different machines. All right, but if there's nothing to mention from the HackMD, I haven't follow it too much. I think we could have a break and then um, we can resume at the 1 p.m. sharp. Anything to mention from HackMD or I guess everything is being answered. Okay. Yeah, thanks.